everyone and welcome to another Scotch Way podcast and we're through in Edinburgh at the fantastic Summer Hall facility to speak to um, writer Ron Butlin. Hello Ron. Hello there. And thank you for doing this. My pleasure. Um, I say writer, I mean that only touches on a, what you do really, a good novelist, poet, playwright, musician, interestingly enough, talk a little bit about that later on as well. But I'd like to concentrate on the fiction, if that's okay with you. That's fine, yep. And particularly because your latest novel, Ghost Moon, um, has just been published. That's it. Um, If you haven't read it, it's a fantastic read, um, which touches on family, memory, old age. Um, Can you just tell us a little bit about it? Well, it's a story of... Uh, it's set in two strands. That's, yeah. that's the first thing. The, the, the main strand is, is set at the very end of the 40s, beginning of the 50s. Yeah. And it's interspersed with short um, sections set in the present day. And basically, it's, uh, we, we get the story of Maggie, who was thrown out of her house by her parents because she was pregnant and this of course being the unforgiving uh, late 40s in Scotland and they didn't come much more unforgiving than that (laughs) and thereafter she had to really fight and struggle to eventually uh, give birth and and bring up her son and the the story tells that but as I say it's also interspersed because the present day is Maggie in when she's 90 and her son, the one that she gave birth to, um, first of all discovers that she's having onset of dementia and then she goes into a care home and then we get, because of the dementia, her grip on keeping the secret and the shame of her past and of course her son's own life, uh, you know, being that he's illegitimate, keeping it secret just begins to loosen and she can no longer hold these secrets into herself and gradually things are released. It sounds terribly serious and terribly dark. There are certainly a fair bit of seriousness and darkness in it, but it's also a a, a story of real courage and determination and uh, a woman's will to take on the highly bigoted society and eventually come through winning. I think that's right. I mean, what struck me is that Maggie's a heroic character. Yes. It's an incredible... You know, you say about being thrown out of the parental home. Yeah. I mean, it's brutal. Yeah. She tries to go back and is not even acknowledged and has to leave again. And it's only with help of um, in-laws. That's right, isn't it? That's, that's right. Your sister-in-law. And, and there are the kind of, help, you know, the assistance of strangers... Uh, along the way, there's an early section where she is goes to Shetland. Yeah, that's right. She goes to Lewis. Yeah, Lewis. Lewis, that's right. She goes to Lewis. And um, what unfolds there is just a fantastic kind of microcosm, I think, of Scotland at that time. You know, welcomed in um, the story that she tells without going to spoil anything, yeah. um, kind of melts the hearts of the people that look after her. And then when the truth comes out, again, again she's, she's expulsion. thrown out. Yep. That's right. The um, thing that I will probably say at this point is it's actually um, based on, it's not not even remotely kind of word for word or action for action, but it's based on my mother's story. Right. Uh, okay. When she was pregnant with me. Okay. And which we, myself and my sister, didn't discover till we were in our 30s because she didn't tell us anything. Yeah. She kept it secret. And then gradually she would... Well, gradually she just came to tell us and we kind of worked bits out. She'd show us little photographs and things and say, we'd think, oh my goodness, what's she doing in this ship? Going to Canada, as it turned out. And um, there was never any, you know, nobody went for Canada for their holidays. They only went to emigrate. And so all these things, and then gradually she began to fill in the details. And then we found out. But the reason that she didn't tell us was because she was so ashamed. And we had to really reassure her that um, what she had done was incredibly courageous and wonderful. And even then, oh man, it was hard work. Yeah. But it was worth it because it brought us all really closer together. There was no more deception. Yes. Well, that's interesting. You know, yeah. when, when the book opens and Tom goes to visit his mother and, as you say, she's got the onset of dementia, and 
she's not quite sure who he is. Like, yeah. I mean, it's quite upsetting scenes. Mm. Um, but this, this, it's almost as though the past reminds her of how strong she once was. Yes. Um, and, and how she managed to, sometimes through sheer bloody mindedness, the stuff with the, the, the um, where her son is kept and she keeps going back and she keeps going back. It's, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's incredible. Yes. To have that kind of um, strength of character. Did you have to do a lot of research into that time? Or, or, or well, I had, I had to do a, a, a fair a fair bit of research, but not, not too much. And by research, I mean I would just ask people. Yes, yeah. And, and I also look at photographs. Photographs are incredibly evo- evocative. And when I was sick, I was brought up in the, in the borders, mm-hmm. but in a very, very small village. But for a year when I was six, we, we lived in Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. And so I do have memories of, you know, child, a child's memory of what the city was like, you know, with um, the last of the, the trams, or the, yeah. the, the pre-trams, as it were, <laughs> yes. the first stage of trams. And just what shops were like and, um, and that feel, it was a, just a different feel to the city. And, and I think in a way, I obviously tried as much as I could to remember and draw on that. But then, as I say, looking at photographs um, would, would spark a lot more memories, more to do with memories of atmosphere than, yeah. than actual detail and also uh, talking to people. Yeah. That, that was really quite important, particularly people who were, um, would have been my mother's generation. You know, they were they were very, very, very helpful. In fact, when I've done readings from the book at various, you know, gigs and festivals and so on, quite a number of times women have come up to me and said, yep, I was ejected mm-hmm. from the family and had a terrible time and, you know, and, you know, that. And once a very elderly woman came up and said, um, we threw our daughter out. Wow. And she just said it was the worst thing I've ever done in my life. We never saw her again, and I've thought about her every day. That's so these things are very, particularly from that time, they are just. Hmm, it's, it's not the just a few pressure of yeah. what's the expectations. I think a lot of people, perhaps, and uh, maybe younger readers, would say, "Well, how could you possibly do that?" You know, yes. but when the whole city, if you like, or the whole country, or whatever. Mm. Um, judges you so harshly it sometimes seems like the only option because losing phase is actually worse than yes. uh, you know solving the problem in any other way yes I mean it's certainly from the parents point of view they just thought we'll get rid of the daughter and get rid of the problem yeah. and I'm sure they all regret I know this woman certainly did but at the time that's where the pressure was because the idea of an unmarried I mean even I can remember as a, as a teenager and that was in the 60s you know, if there was a girl who was pregnant, everyone was really yeah. terrible. I mean, not the kids so much, but certainly the parents. Yeah. So it hung right on. Of course, it was bolstered on every side by, you know, you couldn't get a job if you said you were unmarried. Yeah. If you're an unmarried mother. Um, the church, of course, was really down on that, and it was still very strong. Yeah. I mean, I've, I often wonder how, you know, you talk with the people that come up to you at your readings, how those were certainties, those were certainties that you grew up with, you know, that yeah. I know what's right and I know what's wrong. And as those certainties change or disappear or, or whatever, how that must feel to think, well, I did that, I thought I was doing the right yes. thing. And yet now, by society standards, actually, I would be judged completely differently. Mm. Yes, I think um, people who, like, like the very elderly lady, um, she must just look at the world now and just see a kind of landmarkless place you know there's no real signpost for her apart from what's in her own conscience and that is what she really feels and that really really um, gives her a hard time I can tell uh, you know Edinburgh in the book is it feels buttoned up it feels Mm. you know there's a um, the the street streets are are, are grey and and the the clothing even you know absolutely captures Mm, it's post-war so utility clothes utility furniture rationing that was the standard and then even when I lived here and that would have been for this one year that would have been the mid 50s I remember the parks were the swings would be locked up of course. You know, this sort of stuff. And pubs weren't open. This was no... And Sunday was a time of just silence. 
and the, the whole city was was silent on these one days a week but for the rest of it it was nothing like it like it is now it was a lot more colorless i would say, in some ways in some ways but i remember my mother telling me that when she was saying in the 40s and she would have been a kind of a young woman there she was telling me that they were like along Princess Street and down Leith Walk. There were lots and lots of dance halls where everyone would go. People went around, girls would walk around at night without any sense of fear or threat. So, so there was all this other side of it as well. Yeah. Which was really clearly positive. And this, I mean, it starts out with a, a, um, assignation, I suppose, with someone who's begins with a lie. Yes. You know, got a promise yeah. of, of a yeah. better life yeah. or a different life which yeah. unfolds. Um, it seemed to me that you almost put ever increasing hurdles in my way to get to the end. Yeah. You know, because if you think uh, uh, Edinburgh must have been a strict and, and buttoned up society then for her then to go to Lewis at that time. Yes. You could hardly go to something. Hardly go to it was it was just, She went there because, well, what my mother did, of course, and I tried to put it, do mm-hmm. this in an earlier draft in the novel. Um, but it was just too far-fetched, so it sounded too far-fetched, was that when my mother was put out of the house and went, um, she just panicked and ran and left. And what she did was think, who is the only people she really had heard of? Mm -hmm. And they were distant, distant, distant relatives. And they lived in Vancouver. No, it wasn't Vancouver. They lived somewhere in, in, in Western Canada. So she went all the way there, on the boat and on the train. And then the story we got afterwards was that when she arrived, they just took one look at her and put, slammed the door in her face and oh, she had to come wow. all the way back. That's you know, and that was... Uh, but it just didn't work in the yeah. way, so we, she went to Lewis instead. And uh, in, in the book, uh, in, in Louis, uh, there's a love story there as well. Yes, a very touching right. love story. Um, and a, again, a very difficult love story. Yes. Not just by the distance of... Um, Distance, or you know, the actual physical distance, but um, I don't know, is it Michael? That's Michael, it? yeah, Michael. Um, yes. I've been injured in the. He was, well, he was injured, he was blinded in the war, mm-hmm. and the, the two of them fall in love when, when, she's, when she's staying there. Of course, she's lied her head off about who she is and what her <laughs> situation is, um, but nevertheless, she still falls in love and he falls in love with her, and that comes to a kind of resolution as they do get together. Yeah. But, uh, and it seems to give her strength throughout the whole... There, yes. There are a couple of things that, you know, keep her going. And she draws on, 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 on his love and his understanding and, and acceptance, which probably was, was quite rare apart from her sister-in-law. So she's able to draw on them. But in real life, there was no Michael. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. found he came up in the novel yes. the way that things do. Um, and the character of Tom then is, it becomes... I had to go back to the beginning and reread the first mm. sections because by the time you get to the end, you think, oh, there's more going on with him. And I think it's a lot about someone looking after the, the best way yes. of treating an elderly mother. You know, the irony of how he was almost lost and yeah. put into a home, if you like. Or yes, that's him. right. Yeah. And now she, he's having to do this. He's, for having, he's having to look after her. Tom uh, is, is definitely not me. He's a, he's a kind of, he's a guy that has been damaged by the kind of, by withholding these, the, 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 the story. So he doesn't really know what's going on. But like many things in life, if we don't know it, we don't think we're yeah. hurting with it. But of course he is. And the reader can quick, quite quickly pick, pick yeah. that up. But he does his best by his own, by his own lights. Yeah. And tries to... Hmm. Tries to struggle on with his own life and, yeah. in his own way, um, but the, the the his life is really kind of just more of a sketch, and it's really all about it's really about my yes, life. it is absolutely yeah. yeah. But he he well, there's, there's, he is an interesting touchstone, I think, because you see that there is still care there, and there has yeah. been a life yes. after the uh, what. Unfolds in Edinburgh. There has been a life that has been lived, and there's obviously been strong relationships and all of those things. And I think it's only when you read the whole book that you kind of put that all okay. together. Yeah. Um, and interesting again, the idea of shame 
the fact that she was treated shamefully. Mm. The reason she was thrown out was because the, the parents and were ashamed and whatever, but yet she is still ashamed of her own yes. situation that she will not divulge it. Exactly. That's the lesson that she was that she learned. And it was all around her, her her family and the society. That's what they told her and that's what she took in and gritted her teeth and carried on. Even though she succeeded with what she wanted to do by uh, giving, giving birth and eventually ending up with the child, uh, the shame stayed with her. Yeah. It sounds like a very personal... Maybe all, your, maybe all your stuff's very personal. It's very personal book to write. Was it a difficult book to write? It was very... Yes, it was a hard book to write. And I, and I like everything, I didn't... That, that I write, I don't really plan things. Okay. Um, so it always takes so much longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, that must have taken me about three years to do this book, even though it's a short book. Mm-hmm. So it's only about, I don't know, just over a couple hundred pages or something. But... Um, it, it started off, I, it was quite a wee while till I knew what I was writing about. Sure. Um, and it was just one particular day where, um, so I, was a, I had a week from hell, in fact my wife and I did a week from hell. She'd just been diagnosed with cancer. All right. uh, she's now through it and um, completely recovered and got the all clear, I'm glad to say, but at that point, we, yeah. we just, God, it just absolutely took the ground from under us. Yes. And then about a day or two later, uh, a publisher who will remain nameless um, began really threatening, threatening us to take us to court, or take me to court, sorry, and to sue us for what, so that we'd have to sell a flat. Oh, God. And he was sending us these dreadful faxes all about sort of, you know, that if you you know, you'll be out in the streets sort of <laughs> selling the big issue and all this sort of stuff. I mean, it was a really... We won't, we won't go in no, there, but no. it was just an awful guy. This, he, he took me to court for alleged defamation. Right. And eventually nothing transpired of it. But at that, it was just within a few days of each other. And I remember sitting on the, on the couch in the city room and just saying, Christ... You know, try your best to live, you try and keep your integrity, do the right thing. Yeah. How can things end up so terribly? And I just, yeah, I was just sitting there, just not puzzling, not thinking, just feeling terrible. Yes, sure. And then um, just the, the way, just suddenly the first few words, of it, it's not exactly the beginning of the novel, it's a wee bit later in now, but the first few words of something came, and it was something like you're walking up and down. Uh, the deck of a the deck of a boat. It's sort of this, it's it. I said, oh, God, I don't know what that's all about, you know. <laughs> and then I just sort of I found it. He kept wanting to go more. So, and it's this way that I was asking the question: How did I get in this situation? And mm-hmm. by God, my subconscious was telling me this is how it started. This was your mother, in fact, as it turned out. Which yeah. eventually, you know, months, to, well, weeks later, worked out what I was writing about. It was my mother carrying me, and it was this. It did it quite quite literally how things started. Wow. Very strange. Um, but I do believe that in all, you know, that there is our imagination, whatever you call it, inside of us, is, is a healing part that's on our side and it's also the creative part. And this was it trying to help me. Yeah. And at the same time, it was, the way it was going to help me was by making me go through that whole, that whole thing. And then, yes, and then and it took about three years, as I say, till the book came out. But I was doing other, I did a, an opera in the middle of that and, and a f- collection of poems as yeah. well, I think it was, and occasional short stories and stuff too. Yeah. So there were other things, but sure. but it, that was a span of time that, that, that it took till it was ready. And it was, yes, I mean, it was quite painful to write, but also it was also really, you know, I, I just was able to feel in a sense in a way I never had before to what ex- the what my mother had done how yeah. she you know the, the the utter commitment and commitment to life that she brought to everything you know and and so yeah so I felt very yeah very lucky to be made to explore that and appreciate it sure. and celebrate it yeah, yeah absolutely and yeah. it is a celebration it is a thing. celebration you yeah. about yes. um, as I say I mean a real heroic journey that that shows the human spirit yeah and that's what it's a triumph of the human spirit yeah now it's interesting 
it did, you see, it's on a couple hundred uh, pages. We'll go back to uh, in the sound of my voice, which is sure. Um, I think it's incredible. The first, somebody gets and gave me a copy, and I'm now the kind of person that gives other people copies. So you have to read this. Very book. nice of you. But um, it's, 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 I should say, uh, for those that haven't uh, read it, it's all done, in, it's almost all done in second person narrative. And you just have to pick away and, 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 you know, there's layer upon layer. And I was thinking as I was reading it, this is quite difficult to read. Goodness knows what it must have been like mm. to write. So, I mean, how was it to, to write? Well, just I, again in the same way, I started with a sentence that just, it just uh, popped into my imagination and I just followed it where it took me. But it took me into areas that I could not believe yeah. you know it's a, it is very dark I mean it's also very funny but it's, it was done on parts of it were done on Radio 3 as, as work in progress it was something they used to do um, uh, in an earlier period and when the actor read it he brought out humour yeah. and I said oh my god yeah, it's, quite, but it <laughs> it's is. quite funny but I hadn't really picked that myself yeah. and I was still in the process of writing the book then and and so I thought, oh goodness! So I have to really be able. And then I and then I sort of it made me realise there was more to the book than I had thought. You know, I thought I was just doing this really dark thing, but there was a lot of light, a lot of laughs, a lot of a lot of everything in it. And it's the story of an alcoholic. Yes. Um, in his mid thirties, and I I yes I was in my mid thirties, but I've not been an alcoholic. I'm yeah. glad to say, my goodness, I a real curse that was. Yeah. But. Um, when when I was writing it, some people would say, "Oh, oh I'm writing this story about a guy who takes a drink and that," you know. And then, I think, without exception, everyone said they had someone in their family or a close friend that was in that position, and it made me realise just how prevalent this is. Oh, absolutely, really. Prevalent. And it's kind of astonishing that you get the character of Miguel in his, yeah. um, his uh, addiction so spot on, if you see mm. it through it yourself. Yeah. Now, I know that that's what fiction is, and that's what yes. writing is, but sometimes you need something that's so believable on the page, you think someone has to have gone through that to, to have... Uh, fun enough, roughly at the same time, I read the book Leaving Las Vegas, which oh. they ended the film on, which again is about yeah. someone's alcoholism, but it was written by the guy, you know, it was a kind of memoir. And there are such similarities. Really? In the I've, I've heard about this, but I've, it's not a book that I've read. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah if it came out about the same time, so it wouldn't even have been uh, available then. But uh, yes, so I, I don't know. In his case, it was a memoir, so it, it yeah. was actually his life story then. Yes. In that case, ah, I see. Yeah, it's a kind of. Slightly fictionalised, but he was yeah. Right. yeah. It, it, it was how he wasn't going to stop drinking. Basically, he had made this decision. He oh, he's just going to keep going for it. Yeah. yeah. God. Um, it's so. What, what what was the decision to write it in second person? Narrative? That's just simply how it came. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, I don't think a lot when I'm. I don't think a lot. <laughs> I don't think a lot when I'm writing. I do believe thinking is kind of overrated, and it, get, it really can get in the road when we're trying to be creative because we more or less think the same, more or less logically. And if we do that, we'll end up going down a more or less logical path. It's more or less the same for everyone. Yeah. We're not really going to explore very much. Um, so I tend to trust my imagination a lot and it, and it gave me the first line. Well, that's usually how I start writing something with the first line. And I don't think about it, I just listen to it almost like it was music and see what it, other sounds, what other words it suggests, and then follow it. And this, of course, can result in an awful, <laughs> awful waste of time sometimes. <laughs> when you go off it, tangents have got nothing to do with anything. And then you come back and it's, I spend, I mean, the sound of my voice is only about 120 odd pages, yeah. maybe. Um, but you know, at some points in its in its writing, it was maybe three times that wow. length. And then I would condense and condense it down so that I was really getting to the well. What I hoped was the was it was the heart of yeah, it. Yeah, because you, I would imagine you could. There are other characters in the book, so you could you, you could know, have followed them. Follow them. Yeah. But actually, because it's the you voice, it's. Miguel yeah. went all the way through. And the opening line is, if I remember that, you were at a party when your father died. That's it. And That's so it. immediately, when I first read it, oh, this is, you feel sympathy. And then 
Yes. You kind of have to go to what's actually happened to you, and it's suddenly you're not so sympathetic yes. anymore. And that's how the book unfolds. At times you feel sympathy, at times you feel anger, exasperation, very, very human qualities about mm. this man who, at the end of the day, is really struggling. You know, you have the sections where you talk about the difficulty of breathing and um, kind of making his way through water to, yes. kind of, to, to begin. And uh, mud, 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 that's it. the, the mud that's right. it, yeah. get the clear water. Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, you talk about the human, he calls his children the accusations. That's it's a fantastic yeah. line. And he has hallucinations and, um, you know, you say that you, in the last book, that you um, just spoke to people as way of your research. Was it the yeah. same thing? Yeah. Well, a bit. You know, people would, would tell me things. As you said, I mean, man, I mean, living in Scotland, you don't need to do much research. No, you can just, <laughs> just, just go and stand in the street on a Friday yeah. night. No? Um, no, so, but of course, a lot of what he was doing, his, his was kind of, let's, let's call it middle class alcoholism. Yeah. So a lot of it was happening not on the street. Yeah, so he has a drinks cabinet which he. Uh, which he smashes which his way <laughs> into sometimes. Uh, so so th- th- there, was, there was all that. But I did have a friend of mine who um, was an alcoholic, yeah. and, and after I'd finished it, he did, we, we didn't discuss it beforehand at all after we finished it he he, he read it mm-hmm. and he just was he just said yep yeah, that's that what it? it's like you know what? and I must say I just thought my god is that, is that how, how he's hellish? been living yeah Jeez, I mean, it's amazing how man, people manage to oh how they manage to function to function I, I, I gave a copy to a friend of mine who I knew was a heavy drinker and the, the scene with uh, the snowman where he oh, sees yeah. the snowman in the kitchen and you know it's it's as real as you're sitting across yes. the him and my friend came out and said that's what we used to call what we call the heebie-jeebies which basically was seeing things that were there yeah you know you weren't asleep it wasn't a dream yeah it was just you started to hallucinate hallucinate yeah and then you can't well what the magellan tries to do is to try and he suspects it's a dream and tries to prove it but then realize it you just can't. You can never prove we're not in a dream. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really through them. Um, as you say, when you, it, it sounds like a very dark book, and it is, but there is a humour, and there is, a, again, other people who are supportive, and um, yeah. but it's only when he really kind of hits what they call the well, water. Well, yeah, and begins to feel the pain. The, the drink is like an anaesthetic. Yeah that is stopping him feeling the pain so he just continues to drink and only when he does begin to feel the pain does he begin to have a chance to heal um, and that's for things and yeah. you say that you start with you, you've got the opening line and yeah. then um, the story unfolds from there when did it become the story of a, 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 an alcoholic? Mm. I think it was a wee bit in before I, quite a bit in before I realised that this was this was his situation. Um, you know, it's for me writing and, and uh, I apply right across poetry, short stories, everything. It's more discovery. Yeah. You know, it's, it's something's already there and I just need to uncover it and and I do that. It's a bit like what would it like the archaeologist kind of layer upon layer and then at the end you're down and brushing away and get seen <laughs> hieroglyphics <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and I, I mean I just love that part mm. you know the, the you know the kind of really close editing that could go on and then somebody just say oh great we can throw out all these four pages and suddenly you feel like you've lost weight yeah, you know? yeah. and it's the thing feels more buoyant and full of life without it you know and it's it's, it's good so there's always the kind of first rush which happens day after, well, hopefully day after day, where I maybe write a section for about three or four days, um, probably end up with about, I don't know, maybe say 3,000 words, something like that. If I'm not, no, that's yeah. not as much as that. Less, <laughs> less than that. Less than that, yeah, probably about 1,200 words. And then the next day I'm thinking I'm going to continue this, but in fact something else pops into my mind. Yeah. So I start there, similarly, and then I end up with about... Probably about 30, 40 sections of about three or four pages each maximum, and some of them are maybe only a couple of paragraphs. And then it's almost like try to do a jigsaw yeah. to see how they might fit together, except that there's no there's no picture on the box to aim for, it's just how, how, how it feels. And, the, and these things are pretty 
fluid for me a lot of the time until we get until a pattern emerges I think ah that's what it's about that's how it will fit together and then and then, and then I go on and then throw out some more. <laughs> Do you think that because you write successfully in, in, in other styles as a poet and as a playwright, that that affects your writing of fiction? Do you think it? Oh, I'm does? sure. Because I think it does it in the books. I'm sure it does. I mean, to me, um, if there was a distinction between prose and, and poetry, it would be that prose usually argues through narrative and character yeah. and. F- Poetry usually argues through image, whereas I think with me probably because I'm, you know, I mean, it's a large part of me is, is poetry. Is, yeah. is it, that's how I see things. Is that most of the fiction is argued through image, yeah. and that's yeah. I mean, it, it, that can be a, a real strength, but it, I've also got to watch that we keep the thing moving. Yes. You know, and it doesn't get bogged down and start sounding poetic, which would be the kiss of death, you know. But what well, I say that most of them back to that is it's a real page turn. Yes. You really want to find out what happens next. No, the pace is incredible. Yeah, I mean, that, that has happened. And, and similar with the other books, there's another book I did, Belonging, mm-hmm. um, uh, f- just a few years ago. And that, I was... Even though that's about the long, that's the longest novel I've done. Yeah. It's about two hundred and sixty pages, somewhere about there, and people have read it. Some people have read it in one sitting. Yeah, I think I read it in two sittings. Really? Yeah. Yes. It was a, they just, and yet when you're writing it, you're not the least bit conscious of this. <laughs> you know, just, and yet, and I think great. You know, I think how fantastic that is. That someone's that, been engaged so closely. Does that? You think that comes out in the editing? But taking out, you know, I think so. I think away. yes, yes. I think it does come out. And, I, and to be honest, I, I read, um, I read a lot of the classics, and, you know, contemporary stuff as well. But I also do read quite a lot of thrillers. Yeah. And that has, I've learned a lot from them. Yeah. You know that we don't need to explain things. We don't need to, you know, have long interior monologues about the state of our soul. We need to see it in action. You know. So these are things that I've really learned. We've done a, a podcast a while ago with Doug Johnson. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. And I think that's his real talent is just to get his lean, lean fiction. Yeah. And he just moves right through it. Um, but I think there is something in all your fiction with that if you didn't know, if I didn't know you were a poet, I would say that that's something that you would also do. But I'm interested in writing as a playwright because I can mm. imagine there yeah, it's really important to get rid of those lines that you don't see. Absolutely. Do. I mean, if it, I remember years and years ago, I started doing plays for um, for the radio, mm-hmm. and I was really lucky. I had a, you know, Patrick Rayner was um, head of drama at BBC here, and, and I did oh, quite a number of plays with Patrick, and he was great. I just learned so much. And he just said, right, if it doesn't develop the character or it doesn't develop the narrative, take it out. Even if it's the most biggest universal truth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it goes. Yeah. And I said, oh my goodness. And then gradually I started doing that. And of course, in theatre and, and, and in, on radio plays, you can do that because so much can be done through the voice and the expression mm-hmm. of the you know, physical movement and, 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 and the actors. But... I learned it. And and the other thing I really learned was for quite a number of years, I don't do so much, well, I haven't done it for ages, I, so I used to do think, think pieces, as we call them, for the Sunday Herald. Yeah. You know, writing maybe on politics, on social issues, on the arts or whatever, you know, and 800 words, 1,200 words, 1,500 words, yeah. and it had to be exactly that, and it had to be by Tuesday. Sure. And I love doing these. Yeah. And I really learned so much because I would just write whatever I felt and then I would have to edit it down to 800 or 1200 or 15. And there was no doubt that the more I lost, the better it got. It became much more to the point. Yeah. And I learned so much doing and that. That was yeah. great. Yeah. And you touched that in both uh, Ghost Moon and in The Sound of My Voice. It's family dilemma, and that seems to happen in, in, in most of your, your fiction. Yes, yeah. Uh, night, night visits, my second novel. Yeah. that was that was also there too. Yeah, and again, it's mm-hmm. father dying at yeah. the beginning of the book. Father died at the beginning, mm-hmm. and and then it was about how people cope with that afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you spoke briefly about belonging, and that t- even that title. Um, 
it seems to me there's a struggle for early everyone in your in your fiction, maybe for everyone in most fiction, but to feel that they belong. Yeah. You know, Maggie is looking for someone to belong, and maybe yeah. that was the, the the problem in the first place. Yeah. Magellan has got to the outside world the trappings of a middle, you know, good job, yeah. family, kids, house, all that stuff. But yet he feels he doesn't belong. He feels alienated from all yeah. of this. And in belonging again, it's people searching for for where they can feel at home. Yes, yes, that's true. And I was very. Um, I'll just come belonging in a second. I'll just yeah. first of all say when um, sound of my voice was was it had come out in several editions, and eventually yeah, everyone else came across it. I didn't know Irvin at all. Yeah. Um, he was he was in the states, and he was asked to write for an, art, uh, an article there about a lost classic, mm-hmm. and he picked Sound of My Voice and wrote a piece for it for the New York um, Village Voice. And um, I was like, God, I'm really delighted, you know? And, uh, and he, the, 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 the tenor of his article was that this was a very political novel, mm-hmm. which was utterly news to me. Yeah. I hadn't even crossed my mind that it was political, but I could see exactly once he said it. He said this guy had done everything that Thatcher had said. Yeah. And he got it. He'd, he'd got the job, he'd got the family, he'd got the consumer unit, and he was successful. And yet, as you say, he didn't feel belonged. He felt yeah. alienated. That's fascinating. And that was really, and I just, gosh, it really did make me think, you know, what am I doing? I, I didn't actually realise that. And then when we came to, to, to belonging, it's probably more directly autobiographical, I'd say, than any other novel of mine, I, th- I think, um, in that w- w- when I left school at, at 16, I, right. I came back to university when I was about 21, 22, did a few years, but for most of the time up to my mid-30s, I was just travelling yeah. all over the place. I don't quite know how I managed to live, actually, <laughs> now I look at it now. Well, you've done quite a few different jobs. Aren't yes, <laughs> but this wasn't jobs. The jobs I got so okay. early on. I don't quite know how I managed to do it, but I kind of lived in Paris, lived in Barcelona. I was living in a commune away out in the middle of Australia where I was so far from roads I had to learn to ride a horse. And I was doing all, doing all these things, and I, th- I wasn't aware of looking for somewhere to belong. But I've no doubt that, you know, some analysts would say, oh, yes, this is subconsciously, you were, you know, you're doing this. And so when I found myself writing Belonging, I did find myself drawing on these various situations I were being, and then, yes, it's definitely about a character, quite deliberately. Right. Trying to feel not only where he belongs, but also perhaps the whole of society yeah. belongs it belongs now yeah. and I tried like, like like my mother going to Canada and that I, I did try to first of all set part of it in Australia but it was just so far away yeah. from the bulk of the novel that I had to shift it to, to Spain yeah the the opened, the, I remember right it's a while since I've read it but um, it's in a ski it's and a, a ski resort and of course it's in, yes in both, in chalets and that's the high right. life yes and, and living the high life up there in and in, in chalets that were there, were there were no visitors there. Yeah. And this guy was a guardian, the, the kind of caretaker, and so he had the pass keys, and so we'd go in and help himself. To <laughs> all the booze and the jacuzzi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for that time you survived. Yeah, <laughs> that, maybe that's how I survived. That was it. Yeah. Pass um, keys. You've also written quite a lot of short stories, and yeah. I was interested in the death. The different approach to writing something mm. longer, but maybe with you there isn't a different approach. I don't know. Well, certainly the sound of my voice started as a short story and it just didn't really come to any point. It just seemed to go on and on and on. And so I thought, oh gosh, is this the novel, the first novel? And then um, once, that, once I'd published that, I found myself doing stories again. Right. And it was just, yeah, that's just it. Though quite often the night visits began as a story as well, that's right. Uh, belonging, I think, was always a novel. It was always. Oh no, it wasn't. It was a long short story. It was about <laughs> Seven thousand words. It was too long. Yeah. They couldn't place it anywhere. And uh, and I showed it to Ian Rankin. I said, and, right. and he, he was saying, "Oh yeah, God, that sounds really good," but we had no idea what to do with it. <laughs> and then I thought, "Hmm, I think there's more in here than I'm. I think I've cut it off a bit short, and then it just took off and went elsewhere." Now you're also a musician. 
Well, I'm a, a musician in that I uh, I work with musicians. Right. Rather, I, I do libretti for uh, for opera, uh-huh. and I've you know I've done libretti for for various composers for also texts for symphonies, and uh, or. Oratories, if you can call them, oratory is a bit unfashionable word now. But so for anything, an orchestral piece that requires text. Okay. Uh, you know, I've done, I've done quite, quite so, a bit of that. Forgive my ignorance, but what does that entail for you then? Well, I usually um, let me see. I've done for, it's about seven opera now. Last two, last three, in fact, for, with, with Scottish opera, and they've usually followed much the same pattern, which is I would discuss with the composer um, the kind you know what kind of themes you might be going if, if you had anything you particularly wanted to explore and then I would go and try and write out I suppose it's like a play except very often it's in verse and I'm thinking already in terms of musical setting how right. it might work and then I would give it to him and then he would read it through and maybe make a bit of a start and then he would keep coming. We go. He keep coming back to me, asking me to change things, add things. Can we cut this? Could you give me a different rhythm in this line and that sort of stuff? So it was a lot of toing and froing until eventually we end up with the, the final thing. But with the, the guy, I quite I'd done the last three operas. Uh, Lyle Cresswell was in Scot- well, He's lived longer in Scotland than in his native New Zealand, and he's one of the best known people writing, composing up here. And uh, I remember once getting an email from him saying, I think we're getting pretty close to the, 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 the date for rehearsals. And he said, can I have, well, yeah, can I have two lines of deep despair and a rollicking drunken song by the end of the week? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, great. <laughs> get, on, get on with it. And, um, so that, and, then, and then we go to rehearsals, but by then, well, there's a few minor changes, but things are pretty getting pretty set in stone by then, and you're handing it over to the director. And unless they're particularly wanting things changed, it goes more and more, more and more out of your hands, and, and that's fine by me. Yeah, yeah. But I imagine that you must have have to have a decent understanding of them. Yes, yes. I mean, I do. I, I, I do have quite a strong feel for music. I love music. Yeah. And. Um, in fact, for the last few years now, it's the closest I've come to a job, I think, for <laughs> many, many, many years. Um, it's m- maybe about, I, I, I teach classes, maybe two, two hour classes for about 10 weeks a term at, in the university here right. on music. Okay. So like at the moment, I've got a, a, a history of the symphony that, that's going. And uh, like, mm, Monday we'll be looking at Schubert, that's right. So uh, I do that and I have history of the concerto, I do Mozart, Beethoven, Fantastic. you know, and all, you know, life and music, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Not, not too technical, I mean, really not too, because okay. that would both um, show my ignorance and also that's not, people just want to increase their, their pleasure in music. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's what we do. Yeah. So a bit, 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 bit of gossip as well. <laughs> Um, I'd also like to talk about your time as Edinburgh's Macca oh, and right, exactly yeah. what that uh, entailed. I should say for listeners that Ron um, was the Edinburgh's Port Laureate. So That's right, right for Port Macca. Laureate. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, what exactly did that entail? Well, How did you find it? I was, it was a real, it's, it's not a job, but it's, it's, it's just it's, a, it's an honour that's bes- bestowed. And then the, um, you know, a, a small honorarium come, comes with it mm-hmm. and I would be like, very occasionally I was asked to write poems for speci- you know for specific events which at first I thought oh my god I can't do this <laughs> my creativity can get turned off and on like yeah. a tap the drunken walking song please isn't it? <laughs> and then I found it could get turned off and, <laughs> and I found myself writing about things that I would never cross my mind to write <clears throat> and that was a real pleasure. It really kind of opened things out for me, and it, and it made me, it forced me actually, certainly for these poems, to be pretty accessible yeah. because they would be just they'd be read at, at such and such an, an occasion. So you couldn't go out there and just sort of talk about the state of your soul. You had to be something that was going to immediately be about 
Okay, whatever so it was. The opening of the trams, you would... That kind of... Well, well, in fact, the trams. Hmm. The trams, I actually did write a poem about the trams, and I wasn't asked to write it. <laughs> and I was so angry about the way yeah. it was going, the connect was so obviously going so wrong. And there was a time when there was a tiny wee tram that stood at the bottom of the mound, and uh, it, it wasn't... Can you remember that? Yeah. It wasn't connected, and it didn't go anywhere. And in fact, it vanished after about three months, and I was told it had lost... Lost its planning permission, and it ended up in a shed in East Lothian. Well, I, mean, I gave this tram a voice, so it complained to the council, and it complained about all the, the, the kind of, you know, it was humorous, but it was also pretty, pretty aggressive, you know, about the incompetence, the hinting at corruption, hinting at all the kind of waste that was going, really yeah. just the, the waste and incompetence almost, rather than, than corruption, really, I think. And just, it was just all so botched. Yeah. It was botched. You know, I have heard, yeah, people say, oh, it's bound to be corrupt. No, I, I don't know. I think it's just botched. Yeah. Just things went wrong and contracts were written that, <gasps> that they just drove through without any problem. Anyway, this this was published in the evening news and a lot of letters came in afterwards and everyone going, yeah, you tell them that's the way. <laughs> and I thought, oh, Christ, I'm going to be an unmackered. You know? <laughs> and in Can fact, they, <laughs> <laughs> the exact opposite happened. I, okay. got, um, I got a reply from Jenny Daw, who was in the convener mm-hmm. in verse. And I think that everyone, they, they, it had taken on a life of its own. Of course it had. Of and they just, had. they all knew it wasn't going right, but they just. Too far ahead to stop it. Too far ahead. Well, I remember near the end they were going to stop it. Yeah. But they, it was too far. It was too far. And when they said it was going to only start at Haymarket and go out to the airport, I think that lasted a week because it was such an outcry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, um, what were examples of you having to do, come up with a come up, poem for Come up with something? things. Well, um, let me see. I did, I did a poem for the Malt Whiskey Society right. that was, uh, it was then emblazoned in, in Rose Street for, for a whole winter up on the side of a building, which is very nice, oh, inside, yeah. inside of a, a Rutland, Rutland not a, the hotel in Charlotte Square, I can't remember the name of it. Um, so th- th- there was that, I did a, a very nice thing I was asked to do was that there was a clipper yacht race. Right. And there were lots of um, younger people on it, by that I mean sort of teenagers in early, yeah. early 20s. And they were going round the world and they wanted a poem that they could then, whenever they landed, they could recite oh, that's in a choric fashion. And uh, that was uh, that was so I did that, and that was I mean, never, never in a million years would I have written a choric fashion poem to be recited by by sailors. Uh, but there it was, and and it was good, and it seemed to work really well. So 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 so, so there was that, there was that. Every year there's what's called the Edinburgh Award, right? And uh, that's given to uh, someone that I think it's it's it is it's voted on. Uh, and people can put in suggestions and sort of so I wrote poems celebrating each person so I did one for Elizabeth Blackadder I did one for mm-hmm. Professor Higgs and I, did, I also did one just last year for Ricky DeMarco right. that's right so, so there be these kind of things as well um, yeah just different kind of poems areas that I would never have thought about but yeah it's no, good. Good, good fun, um, good fun. I, listening uh, to you it sounds like you've kind of got to this stage as a writer and, and, and just by doing what you wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's really lovely and quite rare. Um, it's, it's, what, what kind of sparked off the, will, the, the desire to write or to whatever uh, in the first place? I'm not really very sure. I think just like any teenager, um, I was writing the sort of lots and lots of teenagers write. Yeah. You know, and they're kind of, it's a way of sort of trying, it's a bit like keeping a diary, except they, 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 they do, it's almost like song lyrics that they, that they kind of write down. You know, the world's so big, I'm so small, yeah. who am I, why won't you go out with me, this sort of thing. And so I was doing that. And then just by chance, when I, when I left school, I hitched down, it was, it was in London, it was kind of late 60s, and I met uh, some guys who had a band, and we became friends, and, and I didn't play anything. But uh, they, they asked if I would, you know, fancy doing some lyrics. 
So I then started writing lyrics for them. We were a terrible band. <laughs> Pass on that. Okay. But uh, we had great fun, really, really good fun. And then the band stopped and I continued writing lyrics thinking I'd beat another band. But in fact, they began, I began to realise that they were, you know, maybe they should look at them as poems. Yeah. And then began to send them off and then they, eventually they, they wanted to go taken and then more and then there was enough for a book, etc. And then it went on. Went on from there. And so, when you were travelling around the world, were you still writing? Were you still? Oh yes. Se- and were yep. you still sending things in? And I yep, I would have been. I mean, I remember. Yes, yes, I remember when I was. I did. Sound of my voice. I started in London, and then I kind of left left there, and I was over in Paris. And before that. The other, yes, yeah, I remember being in other places and and writing them. Yeah, you know, and I would, it was just something I would do, just sort yeah. of, um, it was just part of the way I passed my day, if you like. Yeah, you know, sure. In the morning, I've always worked. And then, uh, and it's kind of maybe Calvinist Street, and then once it's done, I feel great. I've got, I've got out and play now. Yeah, and so that's like that. It's like a need to kind of get it out again, and then... Yes. Yeah. And, and it's work. really good. And my wife's also a writer, yeah. Reggie Clare, she's a novelist, short story writer. And she's the opposite. She just cannot work in the morning. She would love to be able to do that. But instead, she's always finding urgent dusting and things needing done. And, yeah. and then it takes her time until she can get into it. Yeah. You know, it's just a different, just, just a different rhythm. And we've tried to kind of put a bit more Bring together. together. It doesn't work. You know, yeah, these are your, they're so deeply ingrained in the bones that... How is it living with another writer then? Oh, well, it's really good fun. Yeah. We, we read each other's work. We um, comment pretty frankly and freely. And it's a great support and a huge help. Well, I certainly find, I find that and I think um, Reggie does too. So, so it actually works really well. Um, as I say, I, I'm in the morning and Reggie, you know, after we've had dinner, you know, maybe had you know, dinner, a couple of glasses of wine, everything. I'm just thinking a slow coast <laughs> down to, to, to bed, you know? Yeah. And in fact, she'll just think, right, I'll go and work. Go work and I say, oh, I wouldn't cross my own mind to work. I say, Unless I had a terrible deadline that I had to do, but... It's I, I, so interesting talking to different, different writers yeah. about how they, they work. Um, you know, some say, yeah, I just sit down and I have a blank page and, and other people are terrified that yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I have to have plot. It depends, yes. it depends what kind of writer you are. Mm. Um, I know a Louise Welsh said you can imagine being a writer and having a tidy house because right. <laughs> it sounds like so you might have the opposite. You know, you yeah, tidy it's not we're particularly tidy, but it's <laughs> just that Reggie's always finding displacement activities, yes, I believe we call them. You know, so the procrastination she owns up to. And then so that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think that's the perfect place to leave. Okay, it. well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for doing this. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Thank you and bye. Mm-hmm.